Hey everybody, thanks for uh, joining us on a, a slightly different time, but uh, things things are good. Good to see you, Michael. Yeah, great to see you. Hello, YouTube. Hello and welcome to Python Bytes, where we deliver Python news and headlines directly to your earbuds. This is episode 273, recorded March 1st, 2022, and I'm Brian Aachen. I'm Michael Kennedy. Well, welcome, Mac Michael. It's good yeah. to have us here. So. It's great to see you see you as always. Um, it feels like spring is almost here. It's March. I can't believe it. So pretty awesome. Yeah. Fun to be talking Python with you. Yeah. So uh, should we kick it off with your first item? Let's do it. Uh, I'm a big fan of science and math and all those things. And I came across this article because I was reading about science, not because I was reading about Python. But then I thought, oh, there has to be a Python story here. Let's get into it and see if I can track it down. And wow, was it not easy to find. So here's the deal. I saw an article over on sciencealert.com called Physics Breakthrough as AI Successfully Controls Plasma in a Nuclear Fusion Experiment. That's okay, so me, cool. It's amazing, right? So let me put a few things together here. Nuclear fusion, not fission. That's the kind of nuclear we want. That is harnessing the sun with no negative effects to like turn hydrogen into helium and so on, right? If we could harness that, that's like free, super easy energy forever. It's incredible, right? So people have been working on this for a long time. The way that I understand, which is probably pretty, you know, piecemeal that it works is you put some kind of thing some kind of uh, material like hydrogen or something in the middle, and then you blast it with tons of energy, but then it creates this plasma. You've got to control with lasers and magnets on how you basically keep the pressure high enough in addition to just the heat to actually make the fusion work, right? So there's been some, some success like, hey, we got fusion to work for a while it just took more energy than it put out so you know it's not a super great power plant but it, it it did do the science thing right yeah so here's the deal this article says they've used artificial intelligence to teach it how to make instantaneous or near instantaneous adjustments to the magnetic field and the uh -huh. lasers in order to actually get better results with fusion right so take it farther along and it says, in a joint effort, um, the Swiss Plasma Center and artificial intelligence research company DeepMind, they used deep reinforcement learning to study the nuances of plasma behavior and control inside a fusion tokamak. That's the donut-shaped thing that where the reaction happens. And they're able to make a bunch of small adjustments really quickly in order to get better results and it's, it's pretty wild that they did that with ai isn't it yeah yeah there's definitely python in there somewhere you just know it <laughs> exactly so i'm like all right where is this so i went through and it, they talk about the findings being in nature some of the articles that they're referencing so there's some like deep as in not super engaging sort of scientific articles like the you know traditional academic style of writing that you got to dive into and then like follow a bunch of links but eventually in there, you will find that there is some uh, cool science stuff going on, and Python is at the heart of it. So um, it's probably not worth going into too much of the details of how it, it's actually happening, but it's the, the Python side of things. But I just thought it was super cool that, look, well, here's one of the most exciting things happening in energy and for the climate and for all sorts of things. Yeah. And AI and Python are pushing it forward. That's crazy. And that's what we need for a Mr. Fusion so that we can make flying cars and uh, and and time traveling cars too. Exactly. I mean Marty McFly and Doc, they go and they throw their uh their banana peel on the back of the DeLorean, right? You've gotta have one of these token mucks to make it roll and gotta have Python in the car. Yeah. Come on. Uh, obviously. So cool. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> All right. Well, take us back to something more concrete. Well, okay, so I'm pretty excited about this. It's a it's a minor thing, uh, but maybe not too minor. Uh, PEP 680 has been uh, accepted standards track for Python 3.11. PEP 680 is Toml lib support, so support for parsing Toml in the standard library. We haven't had it That's yet. That's awesome. So uh, it, uh, we've got JSON, we've got CSV. Why not? We got right. XML. Well, and one of the um, and 
now that we we've uh, pip uses toml for pyproject.toml but um and anyway so we kind of need i think it'd be cool to have it in the standard library i think it's fine to have other outside supports so what what they're doing is uh and if uh people don't there's some rationale here but uh you know just think it's easier than normal so toml is i like toml for because it's just i don't know it's an easy format to read it's better than any and some other stuff and, and for people who don't know it feels any like like the dot i and i file style where you've kind of got like section headers and then key value bits yeah and it doesn't and often it doesn't like you can use you can use black and write a pi project toml file without even really knowing anything about toml so it's pretty straightforward but we didn't have a way built into the standard library to just use it so um that's this is this pep uh one of the things there uh the interesting bits about it is it's only reading. So we're, it's only adding support for reading uh, Toml. So there's a, a load and a load load S. So you can load a, fi a Toml file or you can load a string and that's it. Um, and it outputs a dictionary. Um, so uh, and that, that, that makes sense. You, you're just getting a, a Toml object and get it, turning it into to a dictionary so you can use it. Um, but uh, this is built on top of uh, Tomly, so Tomly is being used as a as as the as the library to basically. There's an open source project called Tomly, which a lot of projects are using. Uh, I think this is the one that Pytest is using, and quite a few projects are, have switched to this. It's really fast. It's nice, but it supports like writing as well. But yeah, uh, writing and code and dump ass and all those things. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so but that's um, that's not the part that's going to get supported. And I think that's I think that's fine um, to just have the reading built into. To, in sure. Some file writing. formats like text and and CSV and whatnot, like reading and writing, is super common. Right, but these are way more likely to be used as configuration files that drive app startup and like hide secrets. You know, you put your secrets in there and don't put in Git or something like that. Whatever, right? Th those are the kind of UK use cases I, I would see. And so, in that case, reading reading seems fine. You could always add writing later. You just can't take it away if you add it too soon. Right, right. Um, but <laughs> but also like I, I don't I don't, and I'm sure there are reasons to to need to write it, uh, but. Um, I, I don't, <laughs> you know, it's, it's mostly people write it and computers read it sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Some kind of editor writes it and then you read it. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. So. All right. Well, cool. Very nice to see that one coming along. Um, Alvaro out in the audience. Hello there. says Tommel just reached version 1.0, not so long ago. So maybe that also has some kind of impact on the willingness. Like, all right, the file format is stable now we can actually start to support it in the library that's true and they and we we do support python releases for a long time so that it probably needed to be v1 yeah. at least so and yeah. sam also says there's a lot of stylistic choices for how you write toml files like we need a black for toml not not to drive tom not to configure black but something that then goes against toml files and you know makes them consistent yeah maybe yeah, yeah but you could yeah you could you could bake that in all right what have i got next here i've got uh sticking on the internals here i want to talk about thread locals in python so last time we had calvin on and i spoke about this crazy async running thing that i had built and boy, is it working well. I, like I said, it, it is truly horrifying to think about what it's doing, but it actually works perfectly. So there it is. But one of the challenges that it has is it it doesn't like it if you call back into it again. And I talked about the, um, the Nest Async IO project last time, which maybe will solve it. I tried those and it wasn't working, but it could have been like at a different iteration before I finally realized like, no, I have to go all in on this threading, like isolate all that execution into one place where we can control it. So maybe it would work, but I just wanted to talk about thread locals in Python, which I thought were pretty easy uh, and pretty interesting. So I've got this stuff running over there. And one thing that would be nice is 
each there's different threads calling into the system to say schedule some work for me basically puts it on a queue the queue runs it on this like controlled loop and then it sends it back the result the problem is if if one function calls that to put in work and then as part of doing that work the function itself somewhere deep down like wraps that around it doesn't really like the recursion aspect very much so what i thought is well how do i figure out well this thread has running work <laughs> And if it calls again, you know, raise an exception and say, like, you need to adjust the way you're calling this library. It's not working right. Instead of oh, just yeah. like doing some weird thing. So what I think I might do, and I'm not totally sure it will work perfectly, but the idea is certainly useful for all sorts of things is to use a thread local variable. Now, when I thought about thread local variables, I've used them in other languages and I had no idea how to do them in Python. It turns out to be incredibly easy you just say go to threading the threading module and you say local that becomes like a dynamic class that you can just start assigning values to so in the example that i'm linking to it says you get a my data thing which is a thread local data blob <laughs> whatever so you could say like uh my data dot x equals one my data dot list equals whatever and then that will store that data but it will store it on a per thread basis so each oh, thread has sees a different value so for example what i could do is say thread you know at the beginning of the call like i have running work yes at the end you know roll that back and if i ever call in to schedule some work and the thread local says i'm doing i have active work running well there's that error case that i talked about and i don't have to do weird things like put different IDs of threads into database into like a dictionary and then like check that and then lock it. And like all sorts, I can just say this thread has like a running state for my little scenario. What do you think? I think that's great. I think it's interesting. Yeah, it is. Right. Yeah. And it's right. Not too hard. Just create one of these little local things, interact with it in a thread and each thread will have basically its own view into that data, which I think is pretty fantastic. So it's like a, uh, like a thread version namespace thing. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. It's a cool little isolation yeah. without doing like locks and all sorts of weird stuff that can end up in deadlocks or slowdowns or other stuff. So anyway, if you're got scenarios where you're doing threading and you're like, oh, it would be really great if I could dedicate some data just to this particular run and not like a global thing. Check this out. It's it's incredibly straightforward. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Oh, uh, let me pull up one more thing before we move on, Brian. Okay. Uh, about Datadog. Yes. That's uh, also something else that's extremely easy to use. Um, yeah. Thank you, Datadog, for sponsoring this episode. Datadog is a real-time monitoring platform that unifies metrics, traces, and logs into one tightly integrated platform. Datadog APM empowers developer teams to identify anomalies, resolve issues, and improve application performance. Begin collecting stack traces, visualize them as flame graphs, and organize them into profile types such as CPU, I.O., and more. Teams can search for specific profiles, correlate them with distributed traces, and identify slow or underperforming code for analysis and optimization. Plus, with Datadog's APM Live Search, you can perform searches across all across the full stream of integrated traces generated by your application over the last 15 minutes. That's cool. Uh, try Datadog APM free with a 14-day free trial, and Datadog will send you a free T-shirt. Visit pythonbytes.fm/datadog, or just click the link in your podcast player show notes to get started yes thank you datadog i love all the visibility into what's going on i was just dealing with some crashes and other issues on my uh, on something i was trying to roll out and some libraries conflicting with some other library they were fighting and uh yeah it's great to be able to just log in and, and see what's going on yep. now before we move off the thread locals quick uh audience question sam out there says it might be better to use context vars if you're also working with an invent loop as far as i know context vars are the uh, Evolved version of thread locals that are aware of async too. That's very interesting. I haven't done anything with context vars, but the way I think async IO works is even though there's a bunch of stuff running from different locations, it's there's one thread. So thread local is useless for that. So that's why Sam is suggesting context vars. 
the side that schedules the work has nothing to do with async IO in my world. So that's why I was thinking thread local. Mm. Yeah. But, uh, it's good. Good highlight good to, to say, if you're using async, you may not, you may need something different. Though. Absolutely. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks Sam for that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure if we've really talked about it much, but um, uh, I've got, I, I came across that article from Trey Hunter called what is a generator function? And like Python, especially, you know, the, the two to three switch, even like uh, dictionary, the items keyword, you know, function to get all the, the dictionary elements out, it doesn't return a list anymore. It returns a generator. And um, and maybe it always did. I don't know. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that used to return lists that now return generators. And it kind of, they look, they work great. You stick them in a for loop and you're off to the races. But a lot of people are a little timid at first to try to write their own because it's a yield statement instead of a instead of a return and what do you how do you do it and so this is a great uh, article by uh, Trey to just say here's what's going on it's not that complicated um, generally you just have a you often might have a for loop within your code and instead of returning all the items you one by one yield the items so uh, trade goes through some of the more de some of the details of like how this all works and it's it's pretty interesting it's it's interesting for people to read through it and understand what kind of what's going on behind the scenes so what happens is you your function that has a yield in it it will not return the item right away uh, when somebody calls it it returns an, a, a generator object and that generator object has things like next and mostly that's what we care about. Um, and next returns the next item that you've returned. And then uh, once you run out of items, it raises a stop iteration uh, exception. And that's how it works. But generally, we just don't care about that stuff. We just throw them in a for loop. Um, but it is interesting to, to learn some of the details around it. So. Yeah, they they do seem mysterious and tricky, but they're super powerful. The more data that you have, the way better idea it is to not load it all into memory at once. Yeah, and you can do some fun things like um, uh, um, chunking. You can, you mm -hmm. like, if you're uh, returning, like your your caller, like let's say, and this, these are fun things to do with this. So let's say you're you're reading from an API or from a file or from a device or something, and um, it has you read like a big chunk of things. Uh, like 20 of them or 256 or something like that, a whole bunch of data at once. But then your caller item, your caller really only wants one at a time. It, within your function, your generator function, you can do fancy stuff like read a whole bunch and then just m meter those out. And when then that's empty, you go and read some more and yeah. have intermittent reads. And this will save time for, especially when you're not, you're not reading everything often. Sometimes the caller will break and not utilize everything. So that's definitely where, um, and it, they're very, uh, they're a lot more efficient on memory too. So if you're, like you said, if it's huge amounts of things, it might be either for memory reasons or for speed reasons. These are great. Yeah. yeah so. Even computational, like, so suppose you want a list of pedantic objects back and you're like reading some massive CSV and taking each row and star star value in, in there somehow. Um, that's, the, the actual creation of the pedantic object, if there was like a million of them, forget memory, like even just the computation is expensive. So if you only want the first 20, like you can only pay the price of like initializing the first 20. So there's, there's all sorts of good reasons. Yeah. Okay. I, I do want, I, I do want to just say one thing about generators that I wish there was like a slightly, maybe some kind of behavior could be added, which would be fantastic. So generators can't be reused right yeah. so if i get a result back from a function i try to and i want to ask a question like were there any items resolved in here and then loop over them if there were like you you kind of broke it right you pulled the first one off and then the next thing you work with is like index one through n rather than zero through n which is is a problem so sometimes you need to turn them to a list it'd be cool if there was like a dot two list on a generator instead of having to call list on it, right? Just like a way as an expression to kind of like, I'm calling this and it's sort of a data science flow. I want all one expression and you know, turn this generator into this other thing that I need to pass along. That hmm. would be fun. Cool. Yeah, so um, 
a question out in the the audience that maybe they they return uh, that um, the dictionary items and keys return something different, but um, Sam Morley says they they return special generators, or special kinds of generators. So yeah, thanks, Sam. Cool, indeed. All right, well, what have I got uh, next? I think I just closed it. Now, would it really be an episode if we didn't talk about Will McGugan in some way or another? So we got him on deck twice, but we're going to start with just something he recommended to us that's actually by Sam Colvin, who is the creator of Pydantic. And I don't know, if you're, I'm not sure if you're ready for this, Brian, but this is uh, it's a little bit dirty. <laughs> it's called Dirty Equals. And the idea is to abuse the Dunder EQ method mostly around unit testing to make test cases and assertions and other things you might want to test more declarative and less uh, imperative. Huh. So uh, it all sounds like fun, but how about an example? So it starts out with a trivial example. It says, okay, from this library, you can import something called is positive. So then you could assert one or like some number and whatever, one equal equal is positive. That's true. That assert passes. Negative two equal equal is positive fails. Okay. Okay. How does that strike you, Brian? The, the, uh, we're building on that. We're weird. building blocks. This is like a Lego piece, not the whole um, X wing okay. fighter. Okay. But anyway, so that's the building block, right? Like take something and instead of saying, yes, it's exactly equal, implement the dunder equal method, say in the is positive class to like, take the value, make sure it's a number, and then check whether it's greater than zero, right? That kind of thing. I don't know if that includes zero, but anyway. But then you can get more interesting things. Like, so you could go to a database, and if you do a query against the database, you get, um, I think in the case that's up there, I think you get a tuple back. It depends on what you set the row factory to be, I suppose. But anyway, um, you get a tuple back of results. Uh, it looks like maybe this is a dictionary. Anyway. So then you can create a, a dictionary that has attributes that are like the result you want. They can either be equal or they can be things like this is positive. So in this case, we're doing a query against the um, database. And then we're, it looks like there's maybe it needs to be like a first one. Anyway, it says, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to do equal, equal that um, the ID so we'll create a dictionary, ID colon is positive int, username colon Sam Colvin. So that's an actual equality, like the username has to be Samuel here. Okay. Yeah. And then the avatar is a string that matches a regular expression that's like a some mm. number slash PNG. The settings has to be a JSON thing where inside the settings, it's got some JSON values that you might test for. And the is created now uh, is, is now with some... <laughs> level of variation like some level of precision that you're willing to work with right because obviously you run the database query and then you get the result but it's like very near <laughs> nearly now right it's like the almost equals and float type of stuff that's pretty cool right uh <laughs> <laughs> do, I, do i need to answer i mean i could see no you share your thoughts yeah but the uh, um i don't know it's the api is a little odd to me Okay. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely an interesting idea. It's definitely different. Um, you know, Pydantic is often about. I know it's not Pydantic, but it's by the creator. Pydantic is often about um, given some data that kind of matches. Can it be made into that thing? And I feel like this kind of testing is in the same vein as what you might get working with Pydantic and data. Yeah. And, uh, well, it's definitely it's definitely terse and and uh, and useful. Um, so, and and I I could totally get used to it if this is yeah. uh, this is a pretty pretty uh, condensed way to to compare to see if everything uh, matches this you know, protocol. Yeah, yeah. So Sergey on the audience has like sort of the alternative perspective. Could be you could just write multiple assert statements instead of creating a dictionary that represents everything. You could say, like, uh, get the record back 
and assert that you know get the first value out and assert on it then get the username out and assert and get the avatar and assert on it and so on and it's sort of an intermediate view uh, story where you use the testing libraries the testing classes uh, but sort of more explicit so right and one of the reasons why a lot of people there's there's a couple reasons why to not use more than one assert um because if you were to have multiple asserts, the first one to fail stops the check. It's possible that this will tell you everything that's that's wrong, not just the first thing that's wrong. Yes, exactly. Um, and uh, and then you know some people are just opposed to multiple asserts per test, for just for you know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Um, I mean it, a similar thing. So I, I have a, a, a plugin called PyTest Check, uh, which is um, is just it uses checks instead of asserts so that, that you can have multiple checks per test. Mm -hmm. but, um, it does come up. So this is, this is interesting. I, I'll definitely check it out and play with it. Yeah. Another so. benefit of being able to construct one of these like prototypical documents or uh, dictionaries that then represents the, the declarative behavior or state that you're supposed to be testing for is you could create one of these and then use it in different locations. Like, okay, when I insert a record and then I get it back out, it should be like this. But also if I call the API and it gives me something back, it should also still pass the same test. Like you could have a different parts of my app. They all need to look like this. Yeah. As opposed to having a bunch of tests over and over that are the, effectively the same. And Will is here who recommended this suggests uh, one of the benefits of dirty equals is that PyTest will gener for it, generate useful diffs from it. Yeah, uh, and definitely. Um, reasons, be, PyTest being a reason to use something, I'm, I'm on board then. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, check it out. If, if you do play with it, uh, give us a report how you feel about yeah. it. One yeah, one more question from uh, Sam, uh, said uh, Sam Morley. Uh, PyTest already has something a bit like this with a prox. Um, except for it's for floats, et cetera, except for a prox is not, et cetera. It's just for floats. So you can only yeah. use a prox with floats. So. Yeah. So we have like approximate now yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. So this, I'll, I'll try it, especially, you know, if Will likes it, it's got to be good. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Awesome. So. All right. What's the final one you got for us here? Okay, this is more of a question than a. I'm not like saying this is awesome, but I, I ran across this. Um, actually, this so I, I I I went, I clicked on a listicle, uh, Mike. I think there's a self help group for that. Um, yeah. Uh, well, we're definitely <laughs> prone to clicking on the top listicles yeah. of various. Yeah, so you know, awesome this, Brian, awesome that, and so on. And yeah. I clicked on a listicle. Um. So the the <laughs> listicle was a uh, top ten. Where are we at? Uh, it was a. Uh, uh, 10 tools I wish I knew when I started working with Python. And actually, it's a good list. I just knew about most of them as all. Well. So it's, 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 we'll link to it anyway. It's, it's got the sound of music. Listicle. It's got Jackie Chan. It's got Office Space. Come on. This is a pretty solid yeah. listicle. Let's get well, real. Then I got down to number seven and eight, and I'm like, what are these things? I've never heard of them. So, uh, Committison and Semantic Release. So, um, the, the idea, so the, I, I tried, to do a commit with this. So Committison is a thing that you can say, if you install it, you can either brew install it for your everything, or you can put it in a virtual environment. So that's cool. But it's, um, you, you, instead of just committing, you use this to commit and it asks you questions, right? Instead of typing git space commit, you type CZ space commit. Yeah. And then instead of like it, and it asks you a whole bunch of stuff, it was this a bug fix fix. Was it a feature? Did you? And then it, it follows on what, depending on what you answered, if you had a, if you had a, uh, a bug fix or a feature, is right. it a breaking feature? Did you basically, it's trying to, it's, it, it's doing a whole bunch of stuff, but it's trying to do these, uh, conventional, uh, conventional commits. And we've got a link to this too. And, and then if you've got all this formatting, so it ends up formatting your commit message to a consistent format so that when you're reading the history and stuff, oh, cool. uh, you, can do a whole, you can do a whole bunch of, uh, it's easier, I guess. Um, and then uh, this tool also, uh, this listicle also commented that you've got uh, semantic release, which is a Python package that I ha haven't got th through this much, but it, it can take this, um, uh, all this information from these and do some 
better control your semantic release notes or release. I don't know if it's release notes or just the release version. I haven't got that far into it, but yeah, the commit is an ask. Is this a, like a change corresponding to semantic versions such that it should be a major change? So it'll like, it looks like it'll increment the version and stuff like that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so uh, the, in the about uh, for commit is in, says command line utility to create, commits with your rules and apparently you can you can spec specify some special rules which is good uh display information about your commits uh bump the version automatically and uh, generate a change log that's cool i want that might be helpful um so my questions out to the audience and everybody listening um have you used something like this is it useful uh, is there something different than this that you recommend? And also, what size of a project? Would this make sense for a small or medium project? That's cool. Yeah, let us know on Twitter or at the bottom of the YouTube live stream. It's probably the best yeah. place. Yep. So Yeah, very cool. Now, before you go on, I also have a question out to you. You can be the proxy for the audience here. Notice okay. at the bottom it says requirements 3.6 and above. Right? Uh, yeah. Python. That's not, Ooh. I don't feel like that's very controversial as 3.6 is not even supported anymore, right? Right. So this is like every possibly supported version of Python 3, this works for. Would What would you think if I said the requirement is this is Python 3? Not Python 3, just it requires Python 3. Knowing that like that means or implying that that means supported shipping real versions of Python, not Python 3.1. Right, because obviously Python three one is no longer supported, but neither is three five even. Like, could you say f strings are just in Python three now, without worrying about the version, or do you need do you still need to say three six three block. six three seven? Like, should this be updated to be three seven? You know, I mean, you kind of have to. You think so? I I don't know. I well, I I know. I when I say uh, something is on three Python three, actually, I don't even say that anymore. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. What do you think? Okay. Uh, well, I used it in the sense like, yeah, you need Python 3 for this, thinking, well, any version that's m supported these days. And people are like, well, there's older versions that don't support this thing. Like, well, you know, obviously I'm not talking about the one that was not supported five years ago. Like, at some point, yeah, Python 3 is the, the supported version of Python. I don't know. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Okay. So that's a bit of a, a diversion there, but I, I went down that rat hole and it's like, I really don't know which way I should go, but I feel like there's, there's a case to be made that just like, when you talk about Python three, you're not talking about old unsupported versions. You're everything that's like modern three, seven and above should be like a, an, 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 uh, an alias for Python three. In my I don't know. When we uh, were just saying Python three, what we meant was like three one. So I know uh, we got to get used to that. that there's no uh, Python two really. To, yeah. to worry about all right well that will definitely bring us to our extras won't it yeah all right yeah uh you want me to kick it off since i got my screen up yeah go ahead all right so will like i said he gets two appearances and also his comments so thank you for that and this is like in the same vein of what i was just talking about like what is this convention that we want to have right so the walrus operator came out in three eight and it was kind of an interesting big deal right there's a lot of um debate around whether or not that should be in the language honestly i think it's a pretty minor thing that that's not a, not a huge deal but the idea is you can both test for a variable as well or you use the test or use the value of the variable in the same place that you create it so instead of saying x equals get user or like u equals get user if user is not none or if user you could just say if you colon equals get user do the true thing otherwise then it's it's not set right and so will is suggesting that uh we pronounce the walrus operator as u becomes the value so like x colon equals seven is like x becomes seven what do you think are you behind this okay so you'd be like uh when you're reading your code to yourself yes. how guess. do you say it like if you say um mm -hmm. like uh the lambda expression like how do you like define like the the variables of the lambda? like there's there's terms right. around there that are make it a little bit hard to say without just saying syntax right so he's proposing becomes. like becomes is the the saying the, the verbal the way we verbalize walrus operator 
I like I, it. I'm it, gonna give it a thumbs up. So it's interesting, but what, how is that different from assignment, though? Do we do you say what do you say with assignment? I don't say like X equals. Is, I don't know. Yeah, equals um, assign become becomes works. Um, All right, well, I'll put it out there. People can think about it. And there's a there's a nice Twitter thread here with uh, lots of comments, uh, so folks can <laughs> jump in. Or you could just wal walrus, just talk X walrus five. Uh, oh yeah. Well, what do walruses do? I mean, is there like a cool action that would is like particular to walruses? Walrus well, there probably is, but it's not. It doesn't apply I, to this. It's not very colloquial, is it? <laughs> uh, is X. And John, then John Sheehan out the audience says, in my brain, I use assigned to, and he must know what's coming because he's up next. <laughs> hey, John. Uh, so the other thing I want to talk about is, did you know, I learned through John, that string starts with will take a an iterable, it says tuple, but I suspect it might even be an iterable of substrings. And if any of them match, it will uh, it'll test out to be true. So like A, B, C, D, E, F, you say starts with a tuple, A, B, or C, D, or E, F. Huh. I've never used this. I didn't know that. I that would always just thing. do that as like X starts with A, B, or X starts with C, D, or X starts with E, F. No, you apparently can do that all in one go. What's the two for? Um, I have no idea. Oh, I was okay. just thinking that as well. There's a two and I don't know where it, what it's for. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. yeah anyway that's a super quick one but i thought uh pretty interesting there so yeah. uh, that's all i got how about you i just have one thing i, I we don't need to put it up but all right my extra is this book Woo! So. you have your physical 2.0 book in hand yes i've got i've oh yeah and for the people not the uh not watching um my i've got a stack of uh it's funny my 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 daughter uses my amazon account too so ups said hey there's a package arriving yesterday and i said uh i didn't and i didn't order anything yeah. so i said um i told my daughter hey uh you probably have a package showing up and she's like i didn't order anything um and then th this box arrives with five copies of my book which is great Ooh, that's so, awesome yeah yeah congratulations thanks very cool yeah, we abuse our Amazon account badly. Like, there's a lot of people that log into an Amazon account. We end up getting stuff shipped wrong places because somebody shipped it to their house last time, and then we just hit reorder again. And they're like, why do you have our shampoo? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, John adds that the uh, two is the starting position. Oh, the starting position. Yeah. Right. I figured it had something to do with that. I wasn't sure how many characters to compare on, whatever. Well, I also Thanks. didn't know if the that you could pass a starting position for starts with. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, there's a lot going on here. Almost right. starts with. Oh, uh, yeah, nearly starts with. Yeah, what's the what's the nearly. what's the right way? So I want to close this out with a a joke as always. But there's the joke we talked about a while ago, where. Uh, Sebastian Ramirez, creator of Fast API, saw an ad hiring a Fast API developer. And he said, oh, it looks like I can't apply for this job. It requires four years of experience with Fast API, but I can't possibly have that because I only created it two years ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's a little bit in that vein. So here we have um, somebody uh, tweeting and says, here's a conversation with the recruiter and them. It says, uh, recruiter, do you have a CS background? Yes, absolutely. My CS background. And this is a screenshot from the game Counter-Strike, which is often referred to as just CS. Yeah, of course I got a CS background. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so, that's kind of love good. it. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, a good one. Well, uh, just a question, though. If you, if you did Fast API, instead of eight hours a day, if you did it 16 hours a day, for oh, yeah. two years, would that constitute you know, four that years? Probably, that probably is about the same amount of experience. Yeah. So yeah. what a slacker that Sebastian is. <laughs> Didn't Does he have do to enough. eat or something? Does he have family? What's going on? Come on. Um, yeah, come on. <laughs> well, awesome. always fun with uh, hanging out with you and talking Python. So, you bet. And thanks to everybody on the uh, that listens to it on, on their podcast player or 
watches us on YouTube. So. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. See you later. Bye.